that's excellent. Thank you so much. So I'm, I'm going to open it up now. Anybody has uh, questions, put it in chat. Uh, Peter, you can do a great job of interrupting us. I've got a couple questions from the beginning of the PowerPoint, Mark. Sure. Uh, so I don't know if I change it. Maybe go to slide four. Let's see where we are on slide four. Uh, you can, yeah, right at the top, there's a number. You can maybe type it in or pull down menu beside it. Is that where you wanted? Uh, a little, little bit past that, I think we're. I want to hit where, where they split the brain in half. Okay. Uh, and so it was a. a prim, okay, keep on going. It, uh, it, yeah. The visuals. I want to get to the chicken. Yeah, right, right there. Uh, keep on going with the shovel. Now, the person who was asked about the chicken leg, chicken foot, that. Claw. What he saw, chicken claw. <laughs> yep. He said it's a shovel. Is that and did this person go through that type of uh, uh, split in the brain? Is that sure? They had that. This is somebody who'd had that surgery already. And so somebody sure. who had that surgery can still function as a human being, but maybe sure. just not the same way. Right. That, that's that's very interesting to me. So the same person got asked, "What picture did you see?" And he said shovel, and he stuck to it. Like it was nobody's business. Right. He put those two together in a way that, that was, was what he believed to be the truth. Yeah. So, so listen, <laughs> this is, this is kind of interesting. It just came to my head. Uh, so if you, can, if you see somebody who's just so stuck on their story, now you know it's wrong. <laughs> There's the hard part because you might not know anything. <laughs> but let's assume you showed them the chicken claw. And they're sticking to their story. I mean, we run through people like this all day at work, don't we? I mean, Absolutely. you could almost say you're you're a split brain split brainer. Uh, I mean, how do you that connection? It almost seems like can somebody come out of out of the womb like this? I mean, are their brains connected? <laughs> it's, it's just a question. <laughs> well, you know, in effect, George, uh, this was just the way we figured some of this stuff out. But the reality is our brain is doing this without being surgically split. Uh, our brain is doing that when it looks at the circumstances around it, factors in what it's worried about the most at the moment, and then creates this image of what's going on, this decision. Do I defend? Do I challenge? You know, my favorite, one of my favorite things to do, uh, if you have kids that play soccer, uh, next time you go to a soccer game, stay on the sideline and watch what's going on. So you've got the players. The coach is on one side of the field. You've got the, the parents on the other for very good reason. And the parents are split into two camps. The poor referees out there makes a call. And what's the reaction? One group of parents says, yep, great call, great call. The other group of parents say, they want to go lynch the ref. You know, that was like the worst call ever. And yet everybody's looking at the same thing. The poor ref is just out there trying to survive. So you have three, three groups of people who've all looked at the very same thing, and they've come to wildly different conclusions. How could that be? Right. It all depends on what you see and what you're worried about at the moment, what you're judging what you see by. They interact because what you see is interpreted through your sorting criteria. But what you pay attention to as sorting criteria determines what you actually see. So so this is interesting because as a person who might tend to judge, I don't try to do that much anymore. I might say, no, it's my way. It's the truth, the truth, the way everybody needs to understand it. And of course, I would be incorrect to try to force that understanding. I would be incorrect to force anything on others. I would really uh, be in a better situation if I were to find a way to encourage them to challenge their own um, plausible truth. Yeah, and the first step is to challenge your own. So, George, even though you know what's exactly right in that situation, maybe not. Uh, and the key to your understanding what's missing from your story is their story. That doesn't mean their story is right or correct. It's not fully right or correct either. But if you think of an issue or a problem like a prism, prism has many facets, and you can only see one of those. Uh, the only way to see the entire prism, to understand the full spectrum of the issue or the problem, is to know all the prisms. The only way you can know all the facets of that prism are, are the view of each person 
the view that each person has. So when you have the sense that, you know, I'm right, you're wrong, and you need to listen to me, that's what you need to practice. The, that needs to be the cue for your response, which is self-development. The first, what self-development means is incorporating the basic premise. The basic premise is I need to challenge my story. When you hear something from someone else that doesn't exactly fit with what you think, the question you need to ask yourself is, what am I missing? Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, do you think the world can get along by everybody asking, what am I missing? <laughs> well, uh, I, I don't know if it'll solve uh, world hunger or uh, – you know, the terrorist threat or anything else. But I can tell you this, George, um, in my interactions with uh, patients and colleagues and administrators, I can tell you that it certainly opens the door to getting to an option that will work for everybody, which again is what we'll talk about in session three. You know, I work in an environment that has the most resistant people ever, patients, doctors, and administrators. And I'm in the middle of that in the emergency department. So that's been my testing ground uh, for much of this. What I can tell you is it, you can certainly, if you can't get there, you can certainly de-stress the situation a whole lot. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to get you before the Peter starts asking questions, give everybody a little bit about your background. Cause I do need it. So please yeah. go ahead. Right. So I was trained as an emergency physician. That was my residency training. And, uh, <clears throat> for the past 30 years have worked primarily in small to medium sized rural community hospitals. I did have the opportunity to go to New Zealand for a while and work. It landed in just a wonderful place in Taupo, New Zealand. So I'll give a shout out to those folks. Um, and it was there that I really came in contact with LEAD. Uh, at that time, the health ministry was really trying to encourage the various hospitals and health districts to use LEAD as a methodology for improvement. And I basically dropped into this hospital uh, not knowing very much. And maybe because I was the outsider, the American, somebody different, uh, they basically allowed me to sort of begin to delve into this and practice and try. And we just had some great successes uh, changing things in our department. And not just the changes, uh, it's the changing. Uh, you know, it's why you can't graft someone else's answers onto your situation. Uh, your situation is going to be a little bit different. Uh, but you can use those as examples. And that's one of the things that I learned. When I came back to the States, uh, well, before I went to New Zealand, if I had mentioned lean to somebody in the States, they would have thought like lean cuisine or something. And I was pleased that when I came back uh, after that time in New Zealand, lean as a methodology had certainly gotten a great deal of play. And even if people didn't exactly understand it or know what it meant, uh, they at least understood the, the, what the term referred to. And so um, since that time, I've spent uh, not only continue to work the emergency department, but also to coach and help other institutions and individuals uh, as they're on their journeys to, to, to change. And it's where I, I sort of became, began to understand the language. Uh, change is a noun versus change is a verb. Uh, change is something that someone else wants you to do, which you're likely going to resist, or changing, which is how you take that concept, that idea, that outcome, uh, and find a way to make it work for everybody which is, I think, what Toyota essentially figured out. So, yes, so there is, a, in the Q&A, I do have a, a message from Kit Vincent. Kit, hi. And it says, uh, concerning what questions or concerns do you have, what will make this difficult? That's the, the um, part of what you need to practice. And his comment is, it seems to me, this is change management 2.0 rather than the top down. Follow me as I dig in my heels and wait for your resistance to pass or for you to get a clue, right? Um, what, what you're really doing with these questions is you're trying to sort out the resistance. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next session, but you know, resistance can take many forms. And one form of resistance is silence. Um, and so if there's silence, then you're not gonna know that that person is necessarily resisting. Certainly the person who crosses their arms and says, no, that's, that's pretty clear. But, you know, you, you certainly you've been in a meeting where something is proposed and the meeting ends with nobody saying anything. Everybody just walks out the door. And then what happens is the second meeting, which is as everybody walks down the hallway, looking at each other going, does that guy even get it? Um, so you've got to go search out the resistance. You just can't expect to necessarily see it. You've got to search it out because unless you can surface that resistance and then be able to address it, you're never going to get to the prefrontal cortex. And if you never get to that prefrontal cortex thinking, 
you have no chance of getting to creativity and innovation. There's a specific stepwise pathway that your brain is following from hidden brain to prefrontal cortex to unlock and be able to get to that creativity. And if you never get past that, you'll never get to the creativity. Well, I think what you're alluding to, and correct me if I'm wrong, or correct me if, if I don't have all the facts, <laughs> uh, if I think what you're alluding to is that there are certain behaviors that somebody can exhibit to really um, get through this resistance problem. And it, you're also saying it's not a resistance problem. Resistance is normal. We gotta we gotta celebrate resistance to some degree. It's almost like problems are treasures. Resistance is a gold mine. I mean, is that is that where we're going? No, I, I think that's exactly right, George. You know, the, the, there is the the adage: no problem is a problem. Um, well, no resistance is resistance, and you're exactly right. Uh, it is what we should expect, and in fact, it's what we need. We need to know what this resistance is because that's how we help to inform our own story to make sure that we get it right. We need their resistance in order to get for us to get it right. Okay, so so briefly, I'm going to go to the last question you had, your last slide. And this way we could talk a little bit about maybe what the pattern would be. I'm, I'm just going to rifle through here. I got to. Here we go, 64. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when we see, when we feel, when we, uh, I don't know, get some inclination that there is resistance in the other person from what we're saying, number one is test yourself. In other words, if you're committed to self-development, then that means the first question is, what are you missing? What am I missing as a as a person who's always self-developing? That should always be question one. I'm, I'm, I'm right, right? Correct, yes. Okay, and if I don't think I'm missing anything, or even if I do, and I, I guess this is where Socrates got it right, uh, ask questions to learn and ask questions to teach. Even if you're ask, asking questions to learn, explain where I got it wrong, assuming you got it wrong, you're teaching somebody if they had that gap. Right. And then if, I think number two there is if you're trying to implement change before leaving the room and asking somebody to do something, then you'd be saying, please tell me what questions and concerns do you have about this proposed new initiative? Or is that the, the context of this? Right, whatever idea, whatever notion, whatever proposal, whatever countermeasure, whatever answer is being presented, um, that you're presenting, yes, you should ask those questions because, again, people aren't necessarily going to express their resistance, and that's what you need to know about. What doesn't work about what, what, I'm, what I'm proposing? What doesn't yeah. work about what I'm thinking? Right, and I think you're saying it can't be a yes or no answer. This has to be an open-ended, you're looking for an answer. That's right. Remember, George, that, that the brain is made to act in the face of a threat. Um, and the reason that the brain doesn't gather all the information that it can is that, well, if you did that, the saber-toothed tiger would have eaten you by now. So it has to act, it's geared to act quickly. Um, it's geared to get to an answer. What we're suggesting and what, what I think the brain research is, te is, is telling us and as we'll see evolve through these webinars is that we focus on the answer. The problem is if the answer hits it just right, you're fine. But if the answer doesn't hit it just right, then you've gone off onto a tangent uh, and eventually you'll figure it out, but you will have spent a lot of time and energy to get there. What we're suggesting is that the, the real key is not the answer. It's the questions that make sure that you're getting, in, that you're in the right ballpark. It's the changing, not the changes. And that's where if you ask the right questions as a coach, you're really giving them the answer. Well, what you're really doing is you're making sure that they, that their story is incorporating the right sorting criteria, the right observations. Because right. the fact of the matter is, stories will differ based on those two. But if those two are the same, if we understand them the same, then the stories are likely to be very similar. And then, and then I guess the other part of that is, if the stories are similar, then the options and answers we get to are going to be acceptable and similar. Now, now when you say the sorting criteria, uh, does the brain continue to want to sort? Because this is one of uh, Shigeo Shingo's last books that got published. It was like, all this cloud, okay, but above all the clouds of, of misunderstanding, confusion, there is a sorting process. <laughs> and, 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 and I think he's kind of tapped into this. How does the brain sort? 
we could almost put up, uh, Peter, I think you should take a stab at putting a process flow chart together. Because I think, depending on the context, this is a little bit of a process somebody could adopt. Right. So, George, I'll tell you, you go back to soccer for just a second. When, when I sort of saw this happening on the sideline of soccer games, I went in the second halves of games, I started standing with the other parents. Um, a dangerous practice uh, without my Kevlar jacket. But I started standing with the parents, and inevitably, uh, when there would be a call, and I would see it and say, gee, I thought that was a pretty good call. The other parents would, oh, that was a terrible call. I, there'd always be one parent who seemed to be um, a little more knowledgeable about the game, so to speak. And I would saddle up next to that parent, and we'd start talking about the rules of the game. And they'd say, well, that's not a foul. And I'd say, well, you know, the rule actually is X, Y, Z. Then there'd be a call a few minutes later. And after about half of that half, I'd be standing there with that parent, and we'd be looking at calls and together going, yeah, that was good. No, that wasn't so good, regardless of the team. What was happening was that I helped – to adjust their sorting criteria in terms of what they were using to evaluate what they were seeing, and therefore they were seeing it differently. Now our stories were more similar. Now we were together, so to speak, in terms of what we were seeing and what we were what we were talking about. So the, the your brain is sorting moment to moment. If you remember the slide, the slide that I had where there was going back and forth between the defender stance and the challenger mode, this is happening moment by moment all the time. And as the brain is taking in more information, it's re calibrating, rethinking, rebalancing, uh, resorting, so to speak, um, what its decision is going to be, what its story is. So that's exactly correct, according to the research. You know, yeah, you're a very brave man. <laughs> I've been to some of these soccer games. <laughs> and they know you're from the other team, too. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, any questions, well, let's open it up. I would say is the, the measure that this is successful is that I'm still here and I don't have any holes in me. But it seems like the knowledge level, you've elevated it by bringing your perspective to somebody who would listen. I mean, I think, you know, isn't there an environment there, there that says you need that, you need two people that want to listen to each other before you can make any breakthroughs? Yeah, and again, we'll, th this is, we'll get into a lot more in the next session. But the fact of the matter is, would you have somebody that's totally resistant and not willing to hear anything that you're saying, they've just made a judgment in their brain that they're better off sticking with what they've been doing. That's more li that's likely to be a more successful path than what you're bringing to the table. And you know what? They might possibly be right. Yeah, so, you know, you shouldn't take it personal. Yeah. I have some uh, questions on the chat. Shall the, I read them, or can you read them? Yeah, I got it. So from Blair Hogg, um, is this why liberals and conservatives can't agree on anything, since neither camp will let go of their story and try to understand the others? Uh, Blair, that we're going to talk about this in the next uh, the next session. There's a great study that's been uh, reproduced with um, liberals and conservatives, Arabs and Jews, um, Republicans and Democrats, um, and anyone else who has fixed beliefs about, about what they think is going on in the world. And we'll talk about that in the next session. It's fascinating. Really, we'll respond to to this question. Well, let me promote everybody. I don't think everybody's promoted. And when I do, please take yourself off mute, ask the question and put yourself back on mute. While I do that, I have a question, uh, Mark, on uh, survival. What if somebody's not too concerned about survival? They, um, they're happy, their, their world is content, they're getting fat. I'm talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and they want, they want, why would somebody want to go and, and work really hard for the rest of their life losing weight? <laughs> Can you help me out with this? Uh, so, yeah, so you're, <clears throat> you know, our psychologist colleagues have really demonstrated that the most powerful incentive is something that's near term and negative, right? Uh, and now we kind of see why that is. Again, your brain is uh, – its criteria for success is survival, uh, and everything um, has to feed into that. So if you have a near-term threat, there's a saber-toothed tiger running at you, uh, that gets your attention. You're going to address that because you have to. George, uh, to lose 30 or 40 pounds for something that might affect you 30 years from now, it's not as immediate. Uh, and although negative, not that negative. It's way out in the, in the future. 
So this is because of the way your brain is wired to act. Um, it's not anything bad about you, but it's what makes habits really difficult to correct. You know, I talked a little bit, just briefly talked about habits in terms of a cue, response, and reward. If you've read Charles Duhigg's book, The Power of Habit, um, he's a journalist that has sort of summarized much of what's known about habits. Uh, it's a great source to go to to, to, become, to, get, to begin to come to grips with why we have habits uh, and why those habits exist. I mentioned, I think, earlier that it's really curious how we connect this cue, response, and reward in our brain. What's going on in our hidden brain that puts together these things? It makes absolutely no sense. It's not rational, but that's your hidden brain. Um, and so, uh, really, you know, I mentioned early in the introduction about uh, the glass half empty and the glass half full. You know, we're asking, and we need to survive in this world to get by, we need a glass half full. We need to be creative. We need to be looking. We need to be investigating. But what's our brain doing? Our brain is looking at the world half empty. Uh, and making that transition is a lot of what we're talking about here. Well, I guess it's the will of a CEO who has to just go make it happen. Well, again, we'll talk about that uh, next time. Uh, but, you know, the CEO is just trying to survive also. And the CEO is seeing the circumstances in a certain way. It has a certain sorting criteria that is different than the frontline person or the manager or even the VP or the shareholders or the customers or the public. Uh, and when those sorting criteria differ, we're going to see the world differently. When the CEO doesn't want to play ball, so to speak, or doesn't appear to, that's just because they've made a judgment that what they're currently doing is more likely to be successful than what you're bringing to the table. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much. All right, let's open it up. Anybody has a question, um, take yourself off mute. Ask the question, put yourself back on mute, please. I have a question, uh, Mark. You talked about create an environment that enables people to be creative. How does such an environment look like? Yeah, we're going to get into that in the third session uh, and talk pretty much in, pretty much in detail about what the brain is saying about that environment, what that environment should entail, and maybe some ways we can we can do that. So let's hold that till then if we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. All, all right. So questions um, in general should be around the sorting process. I mean, it sh should really be about um, getting to this stage. Is is everybody here committed to self-development? I, I guess that's why you chose the model, Mark. Is, is that not right? Because that's really the first step. I, I think that's right, George. Um, again, what we're going to see as this evolves is that, yes, we have to do our own work first. We have to be willing to challenge our story to be open to hearing the other stories. And as we coach, and develop, and support others, and we need their story, we need them to be doing the same thing. If we're each doing that, then our stories are going to be better. They're going to be more valid. They're going to be challenges that more apply. And that's how we get to better, better decisions and choices. You know, it's almost like step one is 95% of the battle. Okay, that's what I'm hearing. Because if you can just do step one of the lean leadership development model, which is commit to self-development, everybody does step one, we're laughing. Coaching and developing others is something that comes natural. What do you think? <laughs> I, I think that's right. And I think it speaks to just how powerful these hidden brain patterns are and how so, so well ingrained they are and how so powerful our brain is at defending its truth, its story. Uh, this is not, uh, you know, this has worked well because, hey, we, we've survived as a species. We're still here. But it, it also speaks, and, and you know, as a species, we're going to do things that make us more successful. So if those hidden brain patterns have worked before, even if they're not the greatest, uh, at least they've gotten us to where we are. So it just speaks, George, to how powerful that is. And I think you're correct. Self-development and self-development from the brain perspective in terms of this basic premise is a huge part of that. Once we're open to the possibility, then lots of stuff comes our way. Okay. So I think for questions... Let's focus our questions on self-development, what you as an individual can do or what I can do um, to better align my thoughts to what was presented today. So I have a suggestion about that. Sure. 
this is Caroline Johnson. Hi, Mark. This is great. Really, really interesting and a, such a clear presentation. I would say you have the step of what's my story missing? Tell me your concerns. I would add a third step, which is I think what I heard you say was um, because I think that um, that process of of kind of unpersuading ourselves um, is is really hard and just simply repeating back as silly as it sounds in some way, at least in my experience, asking people to repeat back or repeating back myself what I heard you say, particularly if it's something that I don't particularly agree with, it can be quite, uh, maybe not in that moment, but I think over time that can really work to change our own, uh, you know, the way our, our own frozen views, let's say. So, uh Carolyn, thanks for representing Fab Johnson here. I, I, nice to hear your voice. Um, well, in fact, I think you're right, and I'm going to come at that from a slightly different angle uh, in the next session when we talk about um, the next part of the homework to, to work on. Oh, good. Okay. So, so I got a question for you, though, um, Mark. Caroline uh, brings up an interesting point. This should almost be like a, and this is my paradigm, my apologies for trying to inflict it on our system here. Uh, it should almost be like a closed loop system. I'm asking myself, what is my story missing? So if I think there's something missing, then the next thing I should be doing is asking the person that I'm talking with a question to try to close the loop on my story, to try to get a better understanding. And then, yeah, and then, and then we could get to the point where now I've asked this person to do something. Yes, please tell me what questions or concerns you have now. Uh, I think I, th I think she's got a very good, interesting point. Yeah, and you know this is the first step. So that when you ask those questions, uh, there's really two possible responses. The responses are no, I don't have any questions, concerns. I'm perfectly happy with what's going on, or I'm not. The question is, what do you do when the answer is I'm not happy with what's going on? And that's what the next session will be much about. Great. Good. Any more questions, please? All right, George, seems like uh, everyone out there in the world is uh, going to work on the basic premise and practice and take, take advantage of their neuroplasticity and uh, discover whether this works or not for them and how it helps them or not. And hopefully we'll hear back about that. Uh, well, there's there's more questions. You gotta, oh, good. Uh, I gotta give you a, uh, I gotta give you a process check, uh, Mark. You gotta wait ten long seconds. Peter <laughs> took himself off mute. He was gonna ask a question. Oh, Go okay. ahead, Peter. Uh, a small question. The um, second question, what will make this difficult to do, is that based on feedback you receive in the first question. Or is you know, is that I find that that I always ask those two questions. They're kind of getting at slightly different things. Um, the first question is just trying to open up for the other person the fact that I'm really interested in hearing what they have to say. The second question is uh, trying to then sort of foster their telling me what what it is they don't like. Because you know people will people necessarily won't necessarily tell you what they think but they will always tell you uh, what they don't like about what's going on. Um, so that question is really two part. They've kind of feed together. Um, they can sort of work together. That's been my experience with it. Is there a way to make a connection between what they don't like and what they think? Um, the answer to that is there is clearly a connection, but I think it's hard to know what people are thinking. And I think if you think that you're going to read somebody's mind and know what they're thinking, uh, that is not going to be particularly productive. A lot of times people don't even know what they're thinking. Remember, a lot of this going over their hidden brain, uh, and they may not even be aware of themselves. When you start to ask those questions, what you're really beginning to do is to not only understand what they see as their sorting criteria, but also try to introduce that there may be a fuller array of risks that even they're considering. So okay, this again, is, as we this go is, through, that's this, is meant, this is meant to be funny, but I think if you think that I think that 
I may want to be thinking about what's going on in their mind. You're exactly right. It's kind of futile. I think it does get to that point, don't you? Yeah. But resistance is something you can observe. It's something you can see. That's why that's why resistance is really the thing to sort of focus on. You don't have to think about what that is. It is there or it's not there. Uh, and it's something you could observe directly yourself. Well, having worked with um, uh, Norman Bodek quite some time now, he says resistance is the, he almost calls it the worst thing that can happen. Why is there this resistance? And I think you've, you've nailed it. We know why the resistance is there. He was considering it negative. But really, if we turn it into a positive, now we're thinking about good. Go through the thinking process of getting your story straight. <laughs> Make sure there's nothing missing. And then go through the, the change management process. I, I think this is going to help Norman. I'm going to send him this uh, video. And I want to see where he goes with it because I, I, love, I love the direction. Uh, yeah, please I'll be open interested it up. to see what he says. Yeah, yeah, this is good. So please uh, ask more questions. Uh, keep on going until Mark says I'm out of here. What is that? Okay, so let's uh, let's do this. Let's introduce the next session, uh, okay. and tell us a little bit about what that session is going to be about, and then and then we'll wrap up. Mark, so thank you so much so far, and. And when we do wrap up, I'll just take everybody, everybody can be off mute and thank you for it. But what is coming up? So what we're going to review next time is uh, some of the brain research that talks about this issue of moving people from their hidden brain to their prefrontal cortex, from their defender stance to their challenger stance. Because, of course, unless, unless we're all in our challenger stance, we're never going to get to innovation and creativity. So there's some interesting work that's been done that addresses that. And also, we're going to review some of the research about why it's hard for us to listen. There's actually a really good reason. And why it is that if you're on the front line and you're dealing with the CEO or leadership, they don't get it, and vice versa. There's actually some reasons in our brains for why that's happening. And I think those insights will then help us uh, get to our next step. Um, what are the questions that we need to ask in coaching and supporting others? Just like we've got questions that we need to ask for self-development that will the next step will be what questions do we need to ask when we coach and support others? So that's where we're headed next, George. Okay, I love it. Uh, I got a question for you, and then um, I just put the URL for everybody to go and get a free copy of the ebook. I'm going to put that together tomorrow, uh, and they will be able to download it and give us comments in the uh, documents area where it says webinars, Dr. Mark Jabin. Okay, my question is, you, you have a hidden brain and you've got the challenge, it's a challenging part. The hidden brain you're saying is the challenging mode, right? Well, what I'm really saying is that- the, Or it's the, the defender the, mode. Well, it's really the hidden brain and the prefrontal cortex working together to make a decision about whether to defend or challenge. So are they in the same room fighting? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> uh, yeah, the, yes. In fact, there's a great description of the hidden brain as being a bunch of different voices. The loudest voice wins. Just a melee. Wow. That's the, that's the only thing you know is the voice. You don't know about all the other discussion and yelling back and forth that's been going on inside your hidden brain. Wow. So there could be a little bit of truth mixed up in there. And just like most classrooms, the loudest person kind of gets heard. Mm, wow. How do you defend against that? Well, and realizing that, and as we'll talk about in the next session, there are other, although the person might be representing a certain voice, other voices are in there. And you just have to, how do we get to those other voices? And that's a lot of what we'll talk about. That is so good. I'm, I'm looking, can we do the next session tomorrow? Uh, uh, I want to move okay. it up by a month. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you so much. Everybody, please take yourself off mute. Say thank you to Mark Jabin, Dr. Mark Jabin. And uh, we're going to exit right away. Go ahead, guys. Uh, David, thanks. This was great. Appreciate Thank you, it. Thank you, informative. I really appreciate you guys attending. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Mark. Take care, sure. and we'll talk soon.